Okay, everyone. Right, we're going to give this a give this a whirl. I won't be able to see the uh, the comments on the stream or anything as I'm going through this because I'm literally just working off of this um, digital presentation, this PowerPoint presentation. So um, I think seeing this the little red light says it's live and we are recording. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. We will um, get going. Um, so today's presentation is about Viking Age and Nile binding, and I'm going to go through the archaeological evidence from the 8th to the 11th century AD. Um, my name's Emma, or Brunny, and um, I'm the main person, um, the archaeologist, heritage crafter at Nid um, and I do research and create Nile bound items um, from the Viking Age, but also from other periods of history as well. So. Let's begin. Just a, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I have to put a disclaimer in because of what I'm doing. I'm not charging for this um, presentation at all. This is all open access in, as it goes. Um, and this is just a, highlighting that this is a public presentation and it does deal with material that is publicly accessible and published within the public domain online. So all the information that you're going to see has been collated and collected from digital sources and books and journals from myself. Uh, they've all been referenced appropriately and given the correct mention to who has done the research. And that's also mainly so that you know where I'm getting my information from, but also, um, you know, you can go and follow up other research from other people's papers after the presentation as well. So yeah, this presentation is purely for educational purposes. And hopefully it's going to highlight um, the Viking Age Nile binding material. And um, yeah, if you would like to share it after this presentation, I will be um, jiggling around and making sure that this is accessible on uh, YouTube and on my academia page as well. Um, and I've just popped down the bottom there. If you'd like to reference it and share it away, go for it. Um, tell people about it. Go and do your own research afterwards. That would be marvellous. Just tell people this is what I've done. So welcome everybody, we got there in the end. So this presentation has been created to highlight um, existing finds for this ancient heritage craft and engage more people with this little known historical fibre craft technique called Nile binding. So the presentation will be given by me and I'm going to narrate all the way through and it will be focusing on key finds from the North Atlantic, British Isles, Scandinavia, Northern Europe and Baltic regions. So this presentation will last approximately an hour, but may probably be a little bit longer, um, depending on how much I go into discussing various things. So what will be covered in this presentation? So I'm going to talk about an overview of the archaeological material from the craft of null binding. And as you can see there, I've listed all the different cultural names for null binding that we've got in our geographical areas. Uh, I'll go through the evidence from the geographical areas that I've mentioned. I'll also give names, locations and descriptions of existing material and the proprietors who hold them so you can go and see the collections yourselves when we're all able to. Um, and I'll also talk about the issues of studying Nile binding and textile material from this period. Um, I'll also talk about the positive progression of the study, because um, there is positive progression when it comes to studying Nile binding from the Viking Age and other time periods and cultures. Um, and I'll then also mention institutions, organisations and societies working within this field of study. So you can go and um, check them out as well. I'll also do a couple of suggestions for further research from my own point of view as an archaeologist and heritage craft specialist. Um, as many people have said to me over the years, oh well, uh, there's hardly any material and nobody studies it. So hopefully we'll be able to discuss those things today. Um, then I'll give a bibliography of the sources that I've used because that's quite a nice comprehensive uh, collection of sources and then we'll conclude with thanks. So let's get going. What will not be covered in this presentation, just for those of you that are hardcore null binding fans, is I won't be discussing in-depth uh, terminology relating to null binding because that could go on forever. Likewise, I won't be discussing any descriptions of Egon Hansen's classification system, which is most commonly represented by the O slash U transcriptions of under, over and such, because um, that's a presentation all in its own right. 
Again, I won't be discussing any detailed descriptions of stitch type, form and construction because that is a, another very large topic. Um, and there won't be any demonstrations or practical guides within this presentation as well. And it's important just to highlight that the data compiled here is not a comp comprehensive list of all the null binding from the historical Viking Age that we've got. There are still more um, out in collections. There are several that I'm still aware of. Um, and there's still lots more research to do and reassessment to do. So this is literally just to give you a snippet, an insight into what is available out there. So what is null binding? So null binding, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, is the name used in the UK to describe the historical fibre craft technique that involves using one single needle and uses long lengths of fibre to create particular stitches to build up items such as hats, socks and mittens. Historically, all the items from the Viking Age are made in the round, which means you spiral your textile out from a century focus point. Um, there are different groups and subgroups of Nalvine stitches, depending on how different cultures have interacted with their use over time and as and when the items themselves were discovered archaeologically. But in basic terms, there are three groups of stitches. And we've got the simple looping group of stitch, we've got complex looping groups of stitches, and then we've got very advanced looping uh, groups of stitches. And we just highlighted there the different names of some of the uh, stitch forms. Um, but it's also important to note that there are, of course, variations within each of these groups and the subgroups and stitches. So it's not a, a clear cut um, kind of thing either. So what I really want to get straight into here, we're going going for it now, guys, um, is talk about the earliest examples of gnarl binding that we have within this study area that we're talking about. Um, so this is pre-Viking, but one of the earliest surviving bits of gnarl binding comes from Tiber and Vig in Denmark. And this textile dates to um, 4200 BC. Um, it's part of a submerged Mesolithic uh, settlement context, part of the Ötterbol culture, and the needle binding is actually made from plant fibres in, in this instance, and it is made up of the simple looping form. So uh, you can see the link that I've given there is to the National Museum Copenhagen, where this textile is um, currently residing. So although it is a, a very much an earlier uh, piece of Nalbound textile, it's actually really important to try and understand where Viking Age Nile binding sits within the wider um, context of different types of Nile binding. But the nice thing is, is that this Tiber and Vig example doesn't just stand alone. We have other fragmentary examples from Bokild in Denmark, which again dates to around 300-400 BC. Um, it's this time found in a burial context from the early Bronze Age, and these textile remains have been preserved in the graves of two individuals. Again, these remains are from um, plant fibres, they've been created from plant fibres, but you can see even from the Tiber and Vig um, fragment that I've just showed you and these fragments, um, all these tiny pieces have been identified as null binding, needle binding, um, so we're very lucky to have them from that early period of history because as you can see they're quite worn they're quite fragmentary and takes a very keen scientific eye to actually identify them as such so there's been quite a lot of work done in recent years by uh, Gilly Burner Mannering which I've just referenced there with their textiles and textile production in Europe from prehistory to AD 400 um, and within that paper and within those studies, Gleber and Mannering's research highlights that even though these are Mesolithic and Early Bronze Age cultures uh, we're looking at here, these cultures were still rearing and farming sheep. So when exactly the transition from plant fibres to woolen textiles occurred is still difficult to determine, although research is still ongoing regarding this. But we know that, yeah, they're still rearing and farming sheep. We know that they are still starting to um, use wool materials, but how that moves forward into other historical time periods and archaeological time periods is um, still needs investigating. And one of the main reasons for is this is that the burial customs from these time periods, the Mesolithic and the Early Bronze Age, especially in Denmark, uh, you have the ritual of cremation. 
So you're le left with very little archaeological evidence for any textile preservation or any other archaeological preservation. Um, so this is where we get one of the gaps in the null binding typology, if you like, where we have these lovely early examples from the Mesolithic and early uh, Bronze Age in Denmark, but then there's a gap. And then you start to slowly see from the third to the fourth century AD sporadic bits of Roman Egyptian Coptic Nile binding appearing with the, within the archaeological record again that comes up from the Mediterranean and North Africa. But this just sort of highlights that we've got peaks and troughs in the archaeological evidence with Nile binding, which is why people don't tend to research it because trying to create a narrative with it all is very challenging. But when you try, it is very clear from the archaeological material that null binding is being used by early and contemporary cultures as the historical Viking Age begins. Um, and it continues afterwards as well into the 12th to 16th centuries in the geographical study areas that we're talking about today. And of course, it continues through into modern times. And there's been a resurgence and revival of that as well. Like I mentioned, it's just that the surviving material is very, very scattered. Um, also, different cultures have different amounts of surviving archaeological material for null binding. And you also have to bear in mind that each culture, each time period has different timelines in different countries for different cultural interactions. So they're going to have different dating chronologies as well. So that makes this whole thing very, very challenging for archaeologists and textile specialists to try and string together this narrative. But we can is the good thing. We can, if we try, string together a narrative. Um, and we're going to start right at the beginning with the Oslo Stitch Mitten. Um, I've put in here that it's the original Oslo Stitch Mitten, and it's um, put in that sense because this was the first uh, piece of null binding that was found in um, the, you know, the modern era, in the early 20th century. Um, and after this find, a lot more started to be written about null binding. So it was sort of setting a precedent, if you like. Um, it has recently actually been reclassified. It's not the actual Oslo stitch. It's called the Oslo stitch mitten because of where it was found, which we'll get into discussing that a little bit later. Um, but it's actually been reclassified recently in the last couple of years. And it's actually a variation on a finished part of the Finnish stitch family. So it's a little more complex. It's not your simple Oslo stitch, which is very interesting. But this mitten does belong to the Norwegian Viking Age culture. Um, it was found during excavations undertaken by Gerhard Fischer in the old town of Oslo in 1926. And it's part of this urban settlement context and it dates to the 10th century. So the nice thing with this mitten is that we can we can date it quite nicely. We've got other material from the old town settlement as well. Um, and this um, artifact is now held at the Museum of Cultural History and, or, and the Historical Museum in Oslo. So yes, you can go and have a look at their online database via that link there and have a look at the mitten in closer detail for yourself. Or should you wish, you can go and visit it when you get a moment. So that is our first one, the, the Oslo mitten made out of null binding. Now, some of you might be familiar with this one. We have um, the Mammon stitch detail. It's also, uh, the stitch itself is an Oslo variant, but this is from the Danish Viking Age. And what um, and how this item has been created is that it's actually now bound from fine silver and gold wire work within a sort of a central band or belt trim. And it's possibly worn as part of a decorative cape or a, a band around the shoulders. And it was found in a grave context excavated in 1868. Um, so the Mammon grave itself was full of very well preserved, very high status goods um, from two very wealthy individuals and it dates to around 97 AD. Um, it's recently been highlighted wonderfully by the Fashion in the Viking Age project that has been done with the University of Copenhagen and the Centre for Textile Research. Um, and there has been a reconstruction done of it, which you can go and view um, on their website, which I highly recommend. They've reconstructed a lot of the textile material from that grave. Um, but if you want to go and see that material, it's held at the National Museum of Denmark. And you can also go and have a look at the uh, social media regarding this as well. But this is interesting because this is null binding being used as decorative detail, 
rather than it being used as an actual um, garment or accessory item, such as a hat or a glove or a sock. Speaking of socks, moving on, we're talking about the York Stitch uh, sock or the Coppergate sock. And this is made from York Stitch. It's the only um, archaeological example of the York Stitch that we have at present within the archaeological record. Um, and this um, is part of the English, the Danish, Anglo-Scandinavian Viking culture that appears in uh, England during the 10th century. Um, it's now bound in very fine two-ply uh, yarn, and it's part of this sort of a slipper type sock, and it's got a really beautiful red dye detail uh, wool around the ankle cuff as well and it was actually found in the backyard of a 10th century uh, urban setting in new york during the copper gate excavations that took place in the city in 1976 to 81. so um it's a wonderful example it has got some very interesting features on it it's been repaired it's been worn um and it ended up in the backyard of a 10th century viking settlement um, if you want to go and see it, it's held at the Yorvik Viking Centre in York. And yeah, it's a wonderful example. It's one of the UK's best examples of Viking Age and Isle binding. So if you ever get an opportunity to go and visit it, please do. Now, up on the ante a little bit, we're going to go over to um, the Oslo, another Oslo Stitch mitten, which is actually in Oslo Stitch. Um, and this comes from the Icelandic and Danish uh, Viking Age culture and we have this wonderful mitten, it's absolutely huge um, and it's actually null bound in very coarse um, wool and when they did analysis on it the uh, mineralized pigments within the wool fiber showed that there could be two different colors of wool that have been used. So this mitten may have actually been stripy which is interesting. It doesn't suggest that it's been dyed the wool, it just suggests that they're using two different coloured wool fibres to create their glove. Um, it was found in the excavations at Anhyfestafir in eastern Iceland in the 19th century um, and because it was found in antiquity it was a little bit difficult to ascertain any context for this. All I could find in the uh, National Museum archives was a reference to suggest that whilst uh, somebody was building their home they discovered this. Um, so it could have been part of a, a grave context uh, or a settlement context. It's very difficult to discern which. Um, it dates to the, the 10th to the 11th century. And like I say, it's very, very large. Um, I think overall it's about 20 centimetres, just over 20 centimetres in length. Very large thumb. Um, and yes, this, this item is held in the National Museum of Iceland and as you can see, it's very well preserved. You can see the stitch formation because of the really thick, chunky wall that has been used. Um, and yeah, I was very privileged to be able to go and see this in person when I visited. And um, yeah, just gives you a nice variation as to the different kind of finishes you can get with nail binding. Whereas with the York Stitch sock, we've got a very fine two-ply uh, textile that's been created. This, for obviously reasons of um, keeping warm in the Icelandic weather, um, is perfect for, for those purposes as well. Okie doke. Moving on, we're talking about the Oslo or Mammon Stitch Mitten. Now, one of the common themes about some of these items that I'm going to show you is that uh, because they were uncovered in antiquity, or even being excavated in recent times, because the items are poorly preserved or difficult to identify or sometimes the stitches haven't even been um, identified it's quite tricky to date and figure out um, the context of these particular narbound items so what you will see from now on um, in the slides and presentation is that there are quite broad uh, date ranges for some of the narbound material um, and until they've been proper scientifically analyzed to get a firm date, um, we're stuck with those broad um, dates for these artifacts as well. But this um, Oslo and Mammon Mitten um, is from the Danish-Swedish Viking Age culture and it was found in excavations at Riva um, in 1979 
1982 and it was found in an urban settlement context and as I was mentioning we've got a very broad date range here from 1000 to 1250 AD so we're right at the end of the Viking Age we do know that Ruba as a Viking settlement was being utilised um, but during the Viking Age especially in central Scandinavia you've got a lot of Viking Age towns in the 10th century that go out of use, move location. So there's a lot of mobility um, and changes that go on um, at this time. But this lovely item is held in the museum in Southwest Jutland, so you can go and have a look at it. And it is also available to view on their uh, digital online database. And as you can see, it is very well preserved in sort of shape and form, but you can also see where there are quite a lot of holes and uh, degradation going on where it's been in the ground for such a long time too. Now we're on to something that creates a lot of uh, interest and mystery <laughs> when it comes to nail binding because there is a Dublin stitch fragment and it's a very unique piece. It's a, a, a twisted stitch. So rather than it being a simple uh, looping form or even a complex looping form, it's actually got a twist in the middle of it. So uh, this is from the Irish Norwegian or Hobon in Norse period. Um, and the Narbound fragment was actually found during the Fishamble uh, Street and Wood Key excavations in 1987 to 88. So it was found in an urban Viking Age settlement context. Uh, it's only a tiny fragment. It only measures sort of about three inches in width, uh, but it does date really nicely to the middle of the 10th century. Um, it is held in the National Museum of Ireland, and I did last year try to do an inquiry regarding it to see if they had any more information or even a textile report. Um, but sadly, they got back to me and said that they don't actually know where this artefact is within its collections at present. So it has been analysed by Pritchard in 1992, and it does appear in Wallace's um, Woodkey Excavation publication. Um, so it does exist and has existed up until 2015, but where it is in regards to being held within the National Museum of Ireland's um, collections is another matter that needs to be investigated. So yeah, that's quite a, a intriguing item. Um, next, we move on to something completely different. Um, we're talking about the, the Finnish stitches and the mitten that we have evidence for. So when we go over to the Finnish archaeological material, we're talking about a mixture of different cultural influences. We're talking about the Finnish culture, Norwegian, Swedish, and the interactions uh, mixing there within. Um, and there are at least nine different examples of nail binding from the 11th century in Finland, so right at the end of the historical Viking age. Um, the fragment that I'm showing you here is part of the Eurylusturi mitten, um, and it's held in the National Museum of Finland. Uh, there's been a lot of work in recent uh, recent years done by this, and uh, Christia Vanto is one of the, the leading specialists regarding and uh, relating to um, 11th century uh, null binding in Finland. Um, the interesting thing with the Finnish material, however, it's all from um, grave contexts. And this excerpt is just taken from uh, Christo Vianto's paper on um, null binding and prehistoric burials. Um, and as you can see, all the little arrows are graves that have null bound mittens dating to the end of the Viking Age present and they all appear to be present in 11th century female graves. Um, variations of different Finnish stitch formation um, but yes there's uh, definitely a very fascinating um, pattern going on with that archaeological material relating to null binding as well. Next we're going a bit further eastwards and we talk about the Gdansk stitch mitten um, and this is actually talking about more relating to Polish and Swedish or the Kiev and Rus influence and Viking culture um, in this part of the world. Um, the Narbaum fragment is of a mitten that was found during the excavations in Gdansk in 1950. Um, it's now known that it's definitely associated with the Viking trading centre or emporium and settlement that is in Gdansk during the uh, Viking Age and we know that from other archaeological evidence and um, research that's been done in recent years that the Emporium in Gdansk was very vast and very wealthy. 
So it's being utilised quite heavily during the Viking Age. So this is a fascinating find. Um, like I say, it was found in a, an urban settlement context and does date to the end of the Viking Age, this particular mitten, uh, based on where it was found in stratigraphy during the excavation. Um, and it's believed to be held at the National Gdansk uh, Museum. And there has been a wonderful paper that's been written by Anna Reisbezek, um regarding fabrics in dressing and me medieval dress in Pomerania. So um, her paper is available um, in hardback. I believe if people are interested in following this one up even further. Um, next, we're going on to a different kind of cultural influence, I guess. Um, so this is the salt doll type stitch hat. And when we're talking about culture, we're talking about more of a German, Danish, ecclesiastical uh, Viking Age culture. So it's important to remember that from the 10th century onwards, most of Northern Europe, Scandinavia, North Atlantic, all the geographical areas that I've mentioned about were Christianized by this point. So what we have here is an owl bound full hat of St. Simeon, um, who was a, a patron saint. And it's made from natural undyed wool with silk with a silk band around the brim and with braided detail as well and it survived so well because it's been kept as a reliquary in a box in as a religious object um it was held and kept out for uh religious ceremonies as well as for feast days because St Simeon he was believed to be able to cure headaches so this hat was of, of, often taken out of its reliquary it is noted and uh was used by the priests and the clergy to be able to hopefully relieve your headache and your pain by the blessings of St Simeon. So yeah, it's been very well looked after, but it does date to the, the 11th century. It's very well preserved. It's got a very nice uniform stitch. The salt bell type stitch is very similar to the York stitch in the sense that it's very uh, linear and very springy. So it stretches quite a bit. But it is held in Trier Cathedral, um, so yes, if you get an opportunity to go and, and see this item, please do as well. Next, we're, we're going on to a bit more of the ecclesiastical material. Um, we're talking about um, the Oslo Man Stitch Glove that was found, um, and it's again a German-Danish uh, Viking cultural item. Um, the fragment that we have surviving is part of a silk glove, and it's... Um, partially only surviving because it was actually interred with the Holy Roman Emperor Henrik III in his tomb in Speyer Cathedral. So um, it was discovered, photographed and recorded during the excavations in 1900 um, when they did some um, digging to try and ascertain what was in the cathedral crypt um, and also aid restoration uh, moving forward thereof. But as you can see, this is very, very fine um, wool type and it dates to around 1056 AD so again we're at the end of the historical Viking age and yeah it is still held um, in the historical mu museum of Pan Palatine at Speyer in Germany um, and these items um, the one previous um, and St Simeon's hat and this one and um, the images have both been taken from um, Ulrike Klassen Butner's very well um, collaborative piece of research on null binding um, so yeah this just gives you a bit of an insight relating to the ecclesiastical garments of null binding that we've got as well as the grave material the settlement material as well so this is just another angle to the archaeological evidence next we have the oslo or finnish stitch mitten and it is of a sort of an oslo finnish variant um, like I say, some of this material hasn't been fully um, an analysed or identified yet. Um, and also, as you can see, we're jumping around into loads of different time periods, cultures and languages. So based on the information that I've been able to find so far, some of the information from now on is actually in the presentation is going to be a little sparse. So regarding this particular item, it's Russian, Swedish, Cuban, Russian, Viking culture. Uh, item. Um, it's a Nalbao mitten that was found in the early excavations of Novgorod in the 1960s and it is again part of an urban settlement site. Um, 
where there was a, a Viking Age trading centre in the 10th century in Novgorod. Um, so yes, this item dates to the 10th century um, and it was last dated and looked at in the 1960s. So a reassessment of this item would be lovely. Um, its exact location at the present moment is unknown, but it's possible that it's held within the State Museum collections in Novgorod. Um, and this particular photo and image was taken from a very obscure um, French publication that I've linked in there, which talks about historical different types of null binding, needle work, needle craft as well. So what you tend to find is you get obscure references to null bound items in early knitting history um, publications as well. So you have to kind of dig around a little bit further to try and piece together which item is referring to what archaeological material. Then we have another Oslo stitch mitten, and we're back firmly in the Swedish Viking Age again. Um, this item was found during the excavations of medieval Lund um, in the lower deposits, so it dates to the 11th century. Um, but it is very difficult to find provenance for it. Um, it's difficult to figure out who excavated it and who catalogued it and who looked into it initially. Um, but it is probably held at the Historical Museum in Lund, and as you can see, it is giving a broad uh, date range as well from the 11th to the 15th century, just because we know that it was found during the medieval Lund excavations, but we don't have any more information regarding that. We know that Margaretha Hall did do some work on the Lundavatten, um, so yeah, until I brush up on my Danish and I can have a look at Margaretha's uh, archaeological material in published form as well, um, I'm afraid this is all we have got on this lovely mitten. But again, as you can see, it's very well preserved. We've got the thumb intact and you can still see some of the stitch form as well. Staying with the uh, Swedish uh, Viking Age culture, we now have the Lodos, um stitch mitten. Um, and this was found during the excavations of Langat and Lodos um, in 1972. Um, the mitten is actually made of mixed wool with cow hair, which is fascinating. And as you can see, it's a very distinct and very different uh, stitch form as well, very thick. Uh, but it was found in the urban settlement contexts uh, when they were undergoing the excavations in Lodos. So it's dated to around the 11th to 13th century. So again, we're at the end of the Viking Age, moving into the uh, medieval period. Um, but this item has actually been spoken about recently in the Lodose's um, social media um, campaign. They've been doing uh, different snippets of their historical collections. So uh, the Lodose mitten is actually one of their highlighting items. Um, so yeah, if you get an opportunity to go and jump over to their website or check out their Facebook page. They've actually got a really interesting video discussing this mitten, uh, which has only taken, the video was only taken a little while ago. So then we move on to these wonderful Finnish stitch stockings that we have. Um, and these are interesting because they're part of like a Norman Danish ecclesiastical uh, Viking Age culture. But these Nullbound stockings have been attributed provenance uh, with Saint Germain in France. And they're suggested as being, again, part of a, a reliquary that have been kept with Saint Germain when he's been buried. Um, however, these stockings are now bound in linen. Um, the fact that they have been suggested as being now bound has been questioned. However, the only details regarding these religious stockings is within one reference um, by Birgitta Spedding that I've put in the bottom there. Um, so she dates it to the 11th or the 12th century. The current whereabouts of these stockings, however, is unknown. I don't know what collection they belong to at present. Um, all we know from that particular um, reference is that they are made out of a finished stitch and they were probably uh, used to cover up other vestments at a later date for protection. So other items of um, religious significance have been wrapped up in these stockings, which is why the stockings themselves have been preserved. Um, 
so yeah they're a, a very interesting sort of final item um to the archaeological material that we're going through but as you can see we've just sort of whizzed through all those different archaeological cultures and time periods and influences as well but actually i've just spoken about 23 null bound artifacts from the archaeological record within our historical viking age time frame across our different uh, geographical locations so when we break it down what we're looking at is that the most common item that survives in the archaeology for null binding from the viking age uh, are actually mittens and gloves. We've got a lot of mittens and gloves, um, 18, um, in fact, which I find is fascinating because, you know, not only can your mittens and your gloves keep you warm throughout the year um, as you're wandering around, um, you know, your Viking Age settlement or farmstead, but also they come and are found in a variety of different archaeological contexts. Some mittens and gloves are found in burials, like with the finished material, uh, and a lot of them are found within urban settlement context. So somebody has lost a glove, um, which I'm sure we can all kind of relate to at some point or another. So, you know, the evidence is there, which is nice to see. We also have two examples of uh, stock, socks or stockings that I've spoken about today. So we've got the very uh, elaborate finish stitch socks that we just finished uh, talking about. Um, which are part of a reliquary collection. And then we have obviously the Coppergate sock. Um, we have one hat, St. Simeon's hat, which again is a reliquary item. Um, we have the Mammon uh, item, which is part of the decorative clothing finish where nile binding has been used down the central portion. Um, and then we have, of course, the one fragment which is not identifiable what item of clothing or accessory or textile. Um, decorative finishing it might have belonged to, which is the, the doubling fragment, of course. So when we start to think about what stitches are most prevalent during the 8th to the 11th century, we've actually got quite a few. We've got the Oslo, plus all the different variants. We've got Dublin, Mammon, York stitch, Saltdell, different Finnish stitches, different Russian stitches and their variants as well. So actually, when you start to thread a line through all of these different individual archaeological items we're actually starting to build a data set it's not just one or two sporadic items there are actually quite a few um, and over the last few years you know as textile archaeology and organic materials have started to sort of spark the public um, interest in regards to you know what can survive from different historical time periods um Hopefully, that will mean that we're analysing this material and looking for this material as well when excavations are, to, are ongoing. So now what I'd sort of like to briefly talk about are some of the issues with the identification and recovery of Nile binding within the Viking Age context that we've just gone through. So I just briefly mentioned about preservation and um it, you know, I've included quotes from very well-known scholars within this field of uh, textile archaeology and um, yeah firstly just to give you this quote here uh, generally speaking organic materials and textiles do not always survive in a good state of preservation the fact where the soil deposits will preserve a textile depends not only on their properties of the textile but also on the type of fiber from which the cloth was made the soil conditions favorable to the preservation of animal fibers e.g. wool, and plant fibres, e.g. flax, differ considerably. So for this reason, wool and even silk products are a dominant group amongst archaeological textiles, while linen goods, undoubtedly very popular in the medieval period uh, and earlier, are scarce. Um, so yeah, that just kind of highlights that you're, as an archaeologist, and when you're analysing textiles or organic remains, you're constantly uh, fighting against what is surviving, how has it survived? Um, what kind of part of the culture is it representing? Is it a good representation of the culture that has survived? Is it a poor representation? Um, so that's quite an important thing to bear in mind that all of the archaeological material we have exists purely because it has survived. There's probably an awful lot more material that you know, would have been very interesting and very informative, but it has disintegrated, it has rotted away because of the soil conditions. So we're only left with what we're left with. Um, 
And when it comes to identification, Jane Malcolm Davis puts it really well, you know, in the sense of trying to identify these uh, null bound items has often been a challenge. And she sort of says that knitting um, is it itself as a comparative craft is frequently the victim of mistaken identity. So items made by needle binding are often described as knitting um, and many more items which are knitted remain identified unidentified as well so this whole you know having enough specialists that can identify historical knitting and then historical needle binding or null binding um is a challenge and it's trying to refine those um identification methods um to be able to figure out what kind of archaeological material you're actually looking at because when you're excavating if you uncover something in a context which is covered in mud and vague, it looks like it might be organic, very, very rarely are you going to analyse that at the trench side. You know, it will be packaged and sent away uh, in a careful manner so that it can be conserved and looked at correctly uh, under the microscope and such. So identification of gnarled material is still, and, you know, rightly so, being worked upon. But yeah, trying to decipher between, is it fabric, is it woven, is it null bound, even in academia, is still an ongoing discussion. The next thing to sort of think about in an overarching theme is about the religious and cultural practices. So I briefly touched upon this at the beginning, with the early Danish material that we were talking about. Um, and Neil Price says it really well in a lot of his written material that the burials of pre-Christian Scandinavia in the Viking Age can be broadly divided into a number of basic carity categories. Uh, yet within these categories, the range of individual expression and mortuary behaviour is immense. Um, there's a lot of individuality going on across the board when it comes to burial practices across pre-Christian Scandinavia. Um, we know that the right of cremation in Denmark continues through into the Viking Age, um, which is, again, why we have very little um, archaeological evidence for some of these organic remains surviving. But that's the thing. It's very difficult to create a structured box to put the Viking Age culture as a group of people and how they're using items and interacting with items into one big, big umbrella term when there's so much individual expression and variation within different groups of Viking Age peoples um, at this time. Um, it's also, this kind of leads me on to talking about the mobility of people in the past. People always tend to think that people back in the past were static and not moving around very much. Um, I won't read out all of this quote, but it basically sort of says that Viking um, Viking peoples across all Scandinavia were traders, kings, raiders, mercenaries, you know, moving from different landscape to different landscape. So trying to create a single explanatory framework to explain all of that mobility is a very complex thing. Very, very complex. And this is coming from papers from very well uh, regarded Viking Age archaeologists and academics. And, you know, you try to create a narrative, you try to create a timeline and, um, you know, information based on what archaeological material you have at that present moment. But the important thing to remember with archaeological theory is that it is ever moving, ever changing, ever evolving based on things that get discovered or rediscovered or reassessed. Um, and that's the nature of research. It should be ever evolving and ever uh, fluid. Now, going on to something else that is one of the, the main issues that I sort of touched upon right at the beginning is the, the use of terminology. Um, and Ruth Gilbert puts this perfectly. Um, and she sort of says that the use of place names to identify structures of null binding or techniques is problematic and it should be accompanied by a technical description. But in discussion, saying the Oslo stitch is a great deal easier than U-O-U-O-O. -O -O. And that comes from uh, Marika Klassen Butner's book on non-binding. Uh, what in the world is that? Which, again, is a really good book. I recommend you uh, have a look at. Um, but yeah, Ruth Gilbert gets that in one. You know, you 
we have the uh, historical and traditional names of the items, like the Oslo stitch, the Gdansk stitch, uh, the York Coppergate sock, because, you know, as people, we like to know where things come from and we like to have a location as archaeologists to be able to go, that's the, the place that that artefact was found. But using other classification systems that we'll get onto in a bit, um, yeah, like Hansen's under over notations with the U's and the O's, not everybody is going to be able to understand that. And it's certainly not a method for, uh, or a pattern for recreating uh, null bound items. It is literally just uh, an archaeological tool that was created to be able to identify and classify some of these textiles. So the use of terminology is constantly uh, fluid and ever fluid. Um, and there certainly needs to be more um, investigation into that as well. This other end point here is is pretty interesting, actually, when I was touching upon this again. Um, and it's the issue that we have in null binding and, you know, when researching null binding as an ancient craft is the fact that you have the presence of null binding needles, most certainly, versus the lack of actual null bound textiles. Now, this is an earlier um, quote and I wanted to include it because it talks about a Roman period uh, archaeological textiles in the Netherlands, but it touches upon the same kind of theme. that You've got null binding needles found from the Roman period that confirm that null binding is taking place in these parts, but we have no null bound textiles preserved or surviving. So therefore, do you go as an archaeologist? Well, we haven't got the null bound textiles, therefore it didn't exist. No, you can't do that. You have to say, well, we have the tools present to be able to suggest that null binding took place here in, in this particular Roman period in the Netherlands, but we just do not have the null bound material surviving, probably due to preservation and lack thereof preservation. And this jumps over into a really interesting case study, actually, when we talk about null binding needles that were found in the Faroe Isles. Um, the, the, it's been sort of mentioned that, again, null binding in the, the Faroe Isles is believed to have most certainly been a thing, especially from uh, local traditional folklore and language. There's a lot of links regarding that uh, and null binding as a craft. Um, but, uh, yeah, the form of certain tools fulfills very specific, the form of a certain tool fulfills very specific functional requirements. Uh, Svanberg says, and he says, although the needles for null binding are simple in their construction, they do have a specific and recognisable form. And I completely agree with him that you can, as an archaeologist, once you know what you are looking for um, regarding null binding needles, they are very much of a certain length, a certain shape, a certain form, but then you, of course, have it if items are found within a settlement context, how do you distinguish a null binding needle from a canvassing needle or a netting needle? You know, you have those other questions. A needle can be used for many other things, not just for null binding. But as I said previously, there are null binding needles present in various different contexts. And in this case, in Viking Age, uh, Faroe Islands, they've got archaeological uh, examples there, I can show you on the, the slide of the null binding needles that have been found, um, but no textile surviving. So of course, this again makes trying to track and trace uh, and build a narrative for null binding as a craft throughout the Viking Age a lot harder. So we've got this other piece of fragmentary evidence to consider too. But enough of the issues, let's talk about some of the positives that we've got with the identification and recovery of null binding in Viking Age context, because there is hope, there is definitely hope. Um, and most of that hope actually comes from really well done previous research. The research done by Margaret Hald in 1980 and, and before uh, with her ancient Danish textiles from bogs and burials, a comparative study of costume and Iron Age textiles is one of the most important books relating to um, Viking Age null binding and early null binding. Uh, Margaret Hald was uh, an anthropologist, a textile specialist, an archaeologist, 
and she started to collate all of the material relating to mal binding um, within her research work and um, when it came to Danish, Danish ancient Danish textiles from bogs and burials. Um, so that work is still very, very important, could probably do with, you know, going through that research material and reassessing it, see how applicable it is to some of the more recent null bound items we have uncovered and how it falls within her classification system, which is sort of mainly descriptive. But um, yeah, her work still holds up even all these years later, um, which is brilliant. Then we have um, the work done by Egon Hansen, and his null binding definitions and descriptions. And his approach was to sort of use the work that Margaretha Hald had done, but create more of a classification system, a, a definition for each stitch, each form, each variant, which is where we get the under, over, the use, and the own descriptions coming in. So he's very much forming this definition um, based on sort of knitting mathematics, if you like. He is trying to standardise null binding uh, based on what we know from later knitting and crochet techniques and trying to uh, give a definition to each archaeological item of null binding that we find, whether it be in a Viking Age context or whether it be in a Peruvian context, for example. So yeah, his work is very important, and his work was the work that Ruth Gilbert was, you know, from that quote uh, mentioning regarding that we need to have the archaeological classification of the unders and the overs from Hansen, but we also need the location, and we also need more information on each stitch and each uh, item that is null bound to. Um, then we also have uh, Odd Nordland's work on Scandinavian textiles and knotless netting. Uh, he talks an awful lot about the Oslo original mitten uh, that was found um, and how uh, knotless netting uh, is given as a name for null binding in the early 60s. So, yeah, you've got all these different terminologies and all these different uh, bits of research that have been done previously. And although there are certainly aspects of these three researchers that have evolved and have changed, they're still really good base uh, documents to go and look into when you're trying to research null binding. It gives you a good starting point to try and understand how different people at different you know, times in the past have tried to classify and research and understand null binding. And all these three individuals have all ap approached it in a slightly different manner. It doesn't mean that any one of them is better than anyone else's. You know, they've all got their own merits. Um, but, you know, combined together, this material is very, very valuable. So when we go move forward and are looking to move forward with, you know, identifying new null binding stitches or, uh, you know, figuring out more archaeological material and trying to identify that, we have got uh, work that has been done very recently by Harma Peening in 2019. Um, and she created a new notation system based on um, some of Hansen's work as well as Margaretha Hald's work um, and she's come up with a very eloquent uh, way of putting it that null binding cannot be made without crossed stitches so without these crossings of the legs in the stitches the fabric must have been knitted either on a needle or on a knitting dolly which from an archaeological point of view means that you know without these crossings you're looking at a later knitted item now it might be 12th century it might be 16th century it might be 19th century but the point that Harmer has made is that actually you have to have a crossed point with your null binding so that's one really simple yet effective way in the field or in the conservation lab that you can figure out are you looking at a null bound item you can try and look at the fabric and structure of the Nalvan item under a microscope and see if you have got this crossed stitch form appearing. Um, and then of course with its context and other associated information around whatever item it may be, you can then figure out whether you have indeed got null binding. 
So that is that is really, really good. That's really, really interesting and fascinating work done by Harmer there. Um, and it's, from an archaeologist point of view, very, very practical, very, very useful. Um, I don't have to flick through loads of different um, texts and uh, like comparative photos and imagery to figure out what kind of stitch you're looking at. You can kind of go, ah, oh, it's got across here and it's got across there. It must be more akin to this stitch family or such. So, yeah, new identification ideas are still moving forward. And like I say, relatively recently. So that's a positive for sure. Um, there's also been, of course, the development of different approaches as well. And whereas in the past, sort of even 30 years ago, the approach would very much be, oh, it's it's knitting history and we have to approach it in a very specific knitting history kind of uh, manner. Well, now, actually, archaeology and the study of archaeological textiles and organic materials in particular, um, it's all about interdisciplinary work and looking at as many different avenues as possible to try and figure out how your items are created. So uh, in this particular um, quote, we're talking about, um, yeah, all the different comparative studies, all the different sources, all the different techniques that are available to us now that weren't available to researchers even 30 years ago. So things have moved on a lot when it comes to assessing archaeological textiles. Um, and that's within the textile community and scientific community itself. Scientific approaches have developed, but also in terms of this interdisciplinary work that an archaeological item, a null bound mitten, for example, can't just stand alone in isolation by itself. It's part of the settlement that it belonged to. The, the house that it was found in, the backyard it was thrown away in, the Viking Age settlers that lived in that particular area at that time. It all has a, a narrative, its own biography um, for that artefact. Um, so, yeah, as well as, you know, the scientific analysis itself evolving, we've got to broaden our minds a bit more about thinking you know, about the historical Viking Age and the archaeological uh, Viking Age isn't just one pigeonholed period of time. There's an awful lot of nuance and change. Um, and that is what all these different approaches are showing as well. We can use the scientific analysis to give us our dates and our facts. Um, and as is stated here, remove contaminants and try and do procedures as, as clean and as scientific as possible. But, you know, we have some really good approaches now within archaeology and archaeological theory and science. So new things will be developing, I'm sure. So when we, you know, talk about new things developing, it now's a good time to sort of jump onto the different institutions and organisations and societies that are actually taking part in this kind of uh, forward thinking research. You, you have the Centre for Textile Research that's based in um, Copenhagen. Um, which is one of what well, is the the world's leading uh, centres for organic textile remains uh, conservation research reconstruction as well. Um, we have the Early Textile Study Group, which combines early textile study scholars from all around the world, um, and that also links into the NESTAT, which is the Northern European Symposium for Archaeological Textiles. That also combines textile specialists. Uh, fibre specialists, archaeological specialists, historical specialists. It brings everybody all into the same room together with their symposiums that they hold on a, a yearly basis. Um, and then more broadly, you have uh, societies as well, like the Society for Medieval Archaeology. So as well as talking about the actual textiles and the form and the function of something such as null binding, uh, societies like the Society for Medieval Archaeology will, you know, talk, discuss and submit papers relating to null binding as a craft, for example, in 10th century York. You know, there's a wider context, there's a wider discussion to be had about how, like, the 10th century Coppergate sock, for example, fits in to the society that is Anglo-Scandinavian York at that time. So they deal with wider 
overarching themes as well. So this kind of just shows you what can be done to move the study of null binding forward, really. So I've just come up with a few recommendations and research projects, really, because there are things that can be be looked into for sure. It's not a dead topic at all. Um, one thing that I've suggested that is that null binding needles could be assessed. An assessment of their form, function, application and cultural use could be applied to any archaeological time period and any culture, to be fair, whether it be Roman, Viking, Egyptian, medieval, 17th century. All these different time periods, we have archaeological evidence for null binding within. So that would be interesting. Individual case studies of cultural use of null binding would be good. Like you could do a whole case study on each one of the items that I have just uh, shown to you in the presentation. You could take that item of null binding and talk about it and investigate it not as a case study point of view. Um, a broader, more expansive study would to be to catalogue all the archaeological null bound material from different cultures. You know, that could cover literally across the world. There are, like I mentioned, Peruvian examples, uh, Native American examples. There are Asian examples. You know, we have loads of different cultural pieces of evidence that could be looked into. There could also be a reassessment of material that already exists within collections. Just like with the Dublin uh, fragment of null binding, it's within a collection, but some museum collections are so vast and it is difficult to be able to not only pinpoint a, an artefact in a collection, but also assess it and find somebody to do the assessment that, you know, a lot of items may well still be untapped and unlooked at within collections. So a reassessment of material within already existing collections will actually help us to understand and look at null binding within a whole new light, really. A more scientific sort of approach would be to uh, look at the textile impressions, uh, do a textile impression analysis uh, to see whether we have any imprinting of a null bound item that may have been preserved within the ground but that has since decayed and, and disappeared from the archaeological record. But with compression and time within the soil, what we do see is some archaeological textiles leave a mark on iron, on wood, on bone, on antler. So you might be able to see staining and or impressions if, you know, the right scientific methods are, you know, applied. So that's another possible interesting thing to think about. Um, building up a typology of null binding uh, is one of the things that I'm actually working on regarding a typology for Viking Age null binding. Um, hopefully I've done that a little bit today, been able to highlight what's going on with the Viking Age material, but definitely clearer classification and understanding of the stitches, the variants, their development, their roles is definitely needed across the board. You know, there's there's definitely a need to figure out a more cohesive way of identifying art binding and also um, understanding its wider context within Viking Age culture and society for sure. Um, and this goes hand in hand with what I was talking about earlier regarding interdisciplinary approaches to history and cultural heritage and folklore aspects and linguistic aspects and cultural heritage aspects, intangible cultural heritage aspects. And, you know, there's, there's so many different aspects that could be uh, researched when it comes to null binding, even, you know, as a heritage craft, assessing null binding um, and how it is used for education, display, study in the modern world and how it has a place in the modern world to reflect different periods of the past. So, yeah, there is an awful lot to go at, really, when you start to very finely unpick null binding as a craft that is being used uh, to make items like your hats, your socks, your gloves in the historical Viking age, for sure. But as, uh, yeah, Albert Einstein says, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be called research, would it?
And I think that's a pretty good point to kind of conclude uh, this presentation, really. Um, I'm just going to give you all uh, an opportunity to have a look at some of the sources, the bibliography. There are obviously sources throughout the presentation that you're more than welcome to go and access yourself as well. But um, yeah, there's so much information from very talented scholars that kind of needed to be pulled together. And this presentation is mainly brought together based on being an archaeologist with a background of um, an interest in organic materials and um, Viking Age material culture that for the last 10 years or so working in archaeology and heritage, all I have heard is people going, ah, and I'm finding there's only one item. Nah, they didn't do it. And actually, what hopefully you have been able to see today is that now we have a good assortment of archaeological material from various different contexts. And um, yeah, I hope that it's kind of just sparked a bit of interest and intrigue for you folks today um, when it comes to Viking Age null binding and what on earth it is and what do the items look like and where is the archaeological thought and practice at the moment regarding this. So um, on that note, I think I'll probably draw this presentation to a, an end and just say thank you everybody for watching. Thank